What's up guys, Iceman here. So today, I'm sharing with you a special three-part collection of stories that are, in my opinion, some of the most terrifying and brutal grizzly bear attacks that I've covered so far on this channel. Imagine going into the wilderness to enjoy nature, but instead encountering a deadly predator. That's what happened in these three stories. Keep watching to find out who lives and who dies when they come face to face with one of humankind's oldest enemies, the bear. But before I get into it, I'd like to thank you guys for all your support on this channel, and welcome to all my new subscribers. I'd really appreciate it if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the page, and hit the bell so you're notified next time I post a video. And if you want to support me further, you can become a channel member or a patron. Links in the description below. So let's get into these chilling tales. The following story is one of the most unsettling grizzly bear attacks in modern history, and it's unusual that it took place when it did, in the vast Yukon Territory. Named after the Yukon River, the territory is the westernmost area of Canada, bordering Alaska to the west and the Beaufort Sea to the north. The climate consists mostly of the subarctic classification with varying degrees of precipitation, with some areas experiencing more of a dry summer pattern, but the majority of the land area receiving year-round rain or snowfall. Sparsely populated currently, the Yukon contains some of the earliest evidence of human habitation in America, as it escaped glaciation during the last ice age. At the time of the 2016 census, the population was reported as 35,874, which is actually the highest population density of the three Canadian territories. The economy of the Yukon relies heavily on natural resources. Mining, and especially prospecting for gold, brought many of the early European settlers to the territory, and mining for metals like zinc, silver, and copper is still the largest industry. Outdoor tourism is the second largest segment of the economy, and the Yukon provides vast national parks and reserves, territorial parks, and natural historic sites for thousands of yearly visitors. Hunting and trapping were previously important sources of food and income for Yukon residents, but now those activities are mostly done on a recreational basis. Big game animals in the territory include moose, mountain caribou, elk, wood bison, doll sheep, goat, grizzly bear, black bear, coyote, wolf, and wolverine. Trapping for furs is also done on a licensed, regulated basis. According to the blog of the Yukon Trappers Association, in 2018 there were 560 licenses issued and 349 registered trap lines in the territory. The yearly harvest of furs is estimated by this organization to top $1 million, and it serves as an important winter source of income in smaller communities. Nine fur-bearing animal species in the Yukon are eligible to be harvested for their pelts. Beaver, coyote, ermine, fisher, lynx, marten, muskrat, otter, and wolf. Value of pelts varies depending on animal and condition, but has declined in recent years due to ethical objections to fur as clothing. According to a popular trapping blog, in 2019, a western coyote pelt could sell for $75 to $100, a beaver for $10 to $20, an otter for $20 to $30. Tim Sterling ran a trap line on his recently acquired Yukon property and wintered there with his wife Mallory in 2019. Mallory Sterling, 36, along with her eight-month-old daughter, Maddie, were brutally mauled to death by a desperate grizzly bear on November 12 of 2019. Their bodies were found only 10 yards from the cabin, torn to pieces and half eaten. Authorities estimate it was a rather quick death for the both of them, and the bear was intent on killing and feeding. A malnourished 19-year-old male bear, which greatly lacked body fat, 
not capable of hibernation in its current state. An autopsy revealed the bear pursued an uncommon diet out of desperation, even eating a porcupine in its affliction. Multiple quills were found penetrating its digestive system. Such discoveries revealed the notion that this bear was in great pain and in need of proper nourishment. Bears in the area normally hibernate from November to late spring. It was a rare occurrence in this Northern Territory. And Conservation Services Director Alfred Hitchcock told journalists that the couple were known to be careful in the backcountry, well experienced and knowledgeable about the potentially dangerous wildlife near their cabin. She was a beautiful woman, new mother, and middle school teacher taking two-week vacation to enjoy nature with her family. The family had breakfast together the morning of the attack, a fine breakfast consisting of eggs, bacon, hash browns, and tea. Tim left the table early and put on his outdoor overalls and grabbed his rifle. He set out early that morning to check the family's trap line. Excitedly, he discovered a fisher and two beavers from his quest. A smile enveloped his face as he imagined returning home to his wife with such valuable finds. He began rushing home, only to his surprise to notice fresh bear tracks on his way back. They appeared to be heading towards the family cabin. He made it to his destination, only to find stillness and quietness all about him. No laughing or playing sounds coming from the small cabin. No birds chirping, just silence. The hair on the back of his neck began to stand as he called out for his wife and received no response. He rushed into the cabin, his wife and child nowhere to be seen. He then began creeping toward the nearby sauna, 30-odd six rifle in hand with one in the chamber. About 200 feet from the cabin, Tim heard a growl and a grizzled grizzly bear came blasting out of the bush. He shouldered his rifle and took a shot, hitting the bear in the lower chest as it continued to charge toward him, unfazed. He chambered another round and quickly fired a second time, hitting it in its head, staggering it, but not taking it down. The third shot dropped the bear, and he put in a fourth just to be safe. As the dust settled, the scene became cryptic. He found the mangled bodies of his half-eaten wife and child only a few yards away. Clearly, the bear hid away in anticipation of Tim's arrival, anticipating and premeditating a third kill. Tim dropped to his knees, tears pouring down his face as he grabbed what was left of young Maddie and clung it to him, his life for the moment destroyed. It was found later upon post-mortem examination that the 19-year-old male bear was emaciated and completely lacked body fat, incapable of hibernation. And also, the Department of the Environment investigators found that the bear tracks went off the trail around the time the mother and daughter arrived to the scene, effectively concealing itself behind the branches of spruce trees before the surprise attack. It's likely the bear stalked the woman and child as they went on their early morning stroll around the property, sneak attacking them as it also later attempted on the husband. Mallory had the baby on her back, so it's likely she was attacked and taken to the ground in such a manner. The bear likely mauled her half to death and then pursued the shocked and crying infant, making quick work of its soft and vulnerable, premature, helpless body. It's likely they faced quick deaths as the bear mercilessly neutralized them and fed its starving body. Their blood cried from the ground as all of Yukon gave condolences over these innocent victims' lives. Jeez, what do you guys think about this incident? It's such a horrifying thing to imagine how this could really happen to anyone. Mallory and her husband were very well weathered with outdoor scenarios in the Yukon. They had this cabin for many years, 
and were very knowledgeable about the wildlife. It just seems like it's almost a freak occurrence because the bear should have been hibernating. But it's just one of those things that you can't rule out no matter what. Even if the probability of something like this is extremely low, it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It's simply a matter of whether or not it's possible. And the reality in this situation is it was possible that a bear would still be lurking even though unlikely. And it was possible that this bear would hunt and pursue humans, even though such a thing is considered highly unlikely. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and maybe got something from it. And again, if you want to help me out, you can like the video and subscribe to this page. And I'll be talking to you guys and gals soon with more chilling tales from the Iceman. Clint Adams was goat hunting on Alaska's Baranoff Island last month when a brown bear attacked his party of four. He was hiking with his girlfriend Melody and their guide. As they were being guided up a steep tufted ridge, Adams suddenly heard him shout three words that no one in bear country wanted to hear. Oh, F, run! By the time Adams realized what was happening, his guide had grabbed his 375 h and bolt action rifle from his shoulder and had already passed by him. Adam's own rifle was strapped to his backpack and the only weapon he had on hand was the ice pick he used to climb the mountain. A large brown boar chased the guide and when it passed within range of Adam's, he picked up his ice pick and struck it with both hands, digging the pointed end into the bear's skull, just behind its ear. The bear's eyes were still on the guide, and he continued to pursue. I had the ice pick in hand, and I quickly realized that there was only time for one swing. And when I stuck it in him, he passed right by me, probably only a foot away from my body. And when I stabbed the pick in him, I shook it, and I could feel that it sunk completely down all the way to the handle, and it wasn't coming out. Adams then watched as the bear grabbed the leader from behind and the two rolled onto a flat surface below. The handler lay on his back trying to access his rifle while the eight foot tall boar stood up on its hind legs. Adams saw that the axe was still in the bear's head. In retrospect, Adams knew it was a risky proposition to take his girlfriend on the hunt as she had never hunted before and had spent several days in southeast Alaska. Goat hunting is far from beginner territory. This was her first hunting trip. Both of our families were like, hey, do you really want to go that far? And I was worried as well, explains Adams, who had hunted in Alaska before and had never encountered a bear. But he knew it was dangerous. In the afternoon, when the group boarded a boat across the bay from Sitka, he was more concerned about the strenuous hike than the bears. After reaching a large lake, they loaded the gear onto an inflatable raft and ventured across it. They started climbing the mountain that evening, and they made it about one and a half miles before camping in the rain. The next morning was sunny, and they continued their adventure early. The three headed up a ridge to a good glass spot and used ice axes to drive them into the ground and pull them upward while hiking. They were just starting to get their rhythm, and only about 400 meters from the camp, the guide uttered the three terrible words. And after he said, run, I heard the bear's low, bone-hard roar. Then the guide turned and walked past me, and I looked up and saw the bear coming out of the brush. I could see it, says Adams, who is six foot six inches tall and weighs 285 pounds. Seeing the bear lunge, Adams stretched his body and leaned over his left shoulder to prepare for the impact. But then I saw that the bear's eyes were on the guide. Realizing he was not the target, he drove his axe into the bear's skull. And the bear continued chasing the guide, and he saw them rolling down the hill. The bear crushed the guide by slamming into his backpack while he was on the ground. And when the bear turned around, I saw the ice axe still hanging from his head, Adam says. Adam says he distinctly remembers the muzzle blast that ruffled the bear's fur. The bullet startled the bear, who backed away and hesitated. At this point, the guide pulled out his 357 revolver that was strapped to his chest 
and fired three shots through the bushes and into the bear. The boar attacked the guide again, who leveled his rifle and fired once more. The guide then fired two more shots from his pistol. Adam says he still doesn't know if the bullets hit the bear, but everyone kept screaming and eventually the bear fled. At this point, Adams didn't know if the bear was dead. However, he got back his ice pick. After the second shot, the bear turned away and looked at me from about 100 feet, Adam says. There was one or two bluffs, two steps forward, two steps back. And when it turned and ran, the ice pick fell off its head. The guide did the best he could under the circumstances. The bear charged three times and no one was scratched. His girlfriend was still understandably shaken up from the incident. So the next day, it ended up being only Adams and the guide who set off to finish off the hunt. They shared a tent the following night, and Adams saw the guide sit up and began to scream. It scared the hell out of him, but apparently it was just a nightmare that the guide was having. Adam asked him what was wrong, and he was terrified once again. The guide looked at him and said, it was just a nightmare. I was getting chased by a bear. Jeez. What do you guys think about that incident? It's crazy how they were just chilling. They were just uh, hiking up a mountain or whatever. And all of a sudden this bear bursts out of the woodwork and just goes right for the kill. Like, I wonder what the hell that was all about. And it's interesting how there were three people. Now, I'm not sure how far apart they were, but I know that bears are less likely to attack you if you're in a group. But it's crazy how this bear just didn't care. And he ran right past the guy who stabbed him with a pickaxe and continued to pursue his target. Uh, but fortunately, it seems that everyone was okay. And uh, who knows what actually happened to the bear. Nonetheless, let me know your thoughts on these matters in the comments below and like this video if you guys will. Subscribe to the page and stay tuned for more chilling tales from the Iceman. The bear bit down on Brad's shoulder and effortlessly flung his body several feet to the right, only to charge him again and begin digging into his back. Brad clenched his teeth, hoping and praying to God that the sow would let him go and vanish into the woods. As he gasped for air, she continued to savagely gnaw and chew all over his upper body region. Then, suddenly, without warning, she dropped him. Had his prayers been answered? Did the female grizzly finally feel at ease and assured he was no longer a threat? Brad, laying on his side, opened his eyes, blood draining down his forehead. He tried not to move or make a sound, but was anxious to find if she had left and if he could begin crawling away for help in pursuit of David Zorhoff, who at this moment should only be about a hundred yards away from where Brad lay in ruin. He couldn't hear anything or see anything from his limited viewpoint, so he took the risk. He began to slowly crawl in the direction of help. Before he could make it two feet, horror struck again. She had him by his right bicep, this time clamped down hard with evil intent. He knew if he played dead again, she might leave, but to his horror, he heard something approaching on his right, another bear, a young Bruin, maybe 200 pounds, stepping over his mangled carcass. It lowered its large head and looked Brad in the eyes for just a moment, then pounced, grabbed his face with its jaws, shredding and tearing, almost mimicking its mother's behavior. Two bears, ripping him to pieces. Brad falling in and out of consciousness. Growing up in Seldotna, Alaska, on the Kenai Peninsula, Brad always found hunting to be a form of escapism, venturing out into the great wild, leaving behind the trappings of the world, if only for a moment. It was a great way to clear his mind, to reset, and to gain perspective. He worked on semi-truck air conditioners for a living, made about 65k a year, and always maxed out his 401k. Hunting the bears in this area has occurred in the recent past, but is currently banned due to population decline. 
The Wildlife Refuge on the peninsula is part of the larger federally designed Kenai Wilderness. 1.3 million acres of mostly undeveloped wild lands. An area rich in biodiversity. It is important for both wildlife conservation and outdoor tourism. The Kenai Peninsula brown bear is the charismatic symbol of the wildlife refuge and a bucket list item for many tourists coming to Kenai, Saldatna, or Seward. Fortunately for Brad, he was contacted by David Zorhoff, an old friend from high school who was in need of a vacation as well. David was going through a divorce. It was summer and moose season began in late August. They both took a week off work and purchased a moose tag, which permits the bearer to harvest one bull with spike fork or 50 inch antlers or three or more brow tines on one side. Adult male moose called bulls can reach seven foot tall at the shoulder and weigh up to 1600 pounds. On the third day of the trip, late in the afternoon, David had bagged a huge bull at 80 yards, not far from their rental cabin. It was a chore to field dress such a large animal. They had spent the better part of two hours working on the carcass, but it had to be quartered after being cleaned, then loaded onto a sled and hauled back to the cabin to be strung up. It was getting close to dusk, and David had taken a sled load back to the cabin. Brad was waiting near the gut pile for the sled to return for the final load of meat. He was happy for David's good luck, but he was beginning to doubt his own chances at filling his tag. At first, Brad didn't register the faint sounds he was hearing from the brush. His mind was elsewhere. The noises grew louder. Small twigs snapping. Heavy pine boughs swishing against each other. Brad finally noticed the sound and drew a breath in, sharply. Fifty yards in front of him, the heavy cover split open like a stage curtain to reveal two enormous brown bears, heads lowered and charging. With mere seconds to react, Brad could only lift his arms and yell, hoping to startle them or intimidate them, or at least give them reason to pause. They kept coming, huffing and panting, heads swinging and jaws open. Brad's 30 odd six was next to him, an arm's length away on the ground, and he scrambled for it. He got off one shot from the waist, then the bears were on him, swatting the rifle away like a toy and shoving the man backwards into a low patch of juniper. A massive weight pinned his lower body down, but his arms were free and he flailed them with all his might, trying uselessly to push the larger 800 pound sow off his hips and legs. And suddenly he remembered, play dead. Brad knew in that moment it was his only chance of survival. He played dead through pain, worse than he could have ever imagined. He felt their fangs pierce his legs and buttocks. The smaller bear, probably the sow's juvenile cub, began digging into one of his thighs, flaying apart the muscle to reveal bone. They bit up and down his spine like a dog trying to break every bone in the body of a large rodent. At least at this point, the pain was beginning to fade. Brad no longer felt the pain, but his mind was filling with horror. Would he be paralyzed for life? Never able to walk again? Would he die? He heard the sound of bones cracking under his thick Carhartt overalls. One of the creatures grabbed his skull in its jaws trying to pull it forward in an attempt to reach Brad's vulnerable neck. He kept his chin tucked down to his chest tightly, and his arms were clenched protectively over his head. But their strength was astonishing. They refused to let up, and seemed to get more aggravated the more he protected himself. Huge clawed feet stomped on his chest, pushing him further into the ground. Jaws with long, yellow canines gripped his skull, and Brad imagined that this must be what death feels like. Impossibly, they stopped to rest. Brad lay where the bears left him. For whole minutes, 
He lay still and breathed, not sure if he could move, even if he wanted to. He looked in the direction of the bears and wiped the blood from his eyes. Mistake. They had been watching him, and in seconds, they rushed his body again. This time, Brad felt that he observed from a distance as two bears tackled a man's broken body. He could see their gnawing jaws again, feeling for the places they had missed the last time. He had no choice this time but to play dead. His energy was spent, and he knew he didn't have much life left. How much blood has been lost? Again, the bears tire of their game and wander off. This time, Brad knew they were only a few yards away, watching again, probably watching him as they raided the gut pile from the moose. He lay still, this time with no intention of moving. A silence fell over the clearing, and Brad couldn't hear the bears at all. Suddenly, a loud shot broke the silence, and the air was full of the sounds of two retreating bears, crashing loudly through the underbrush. David! Brad gasped. David! Help! With his final breaths, more gunshots. The sounds rung in Brad's ears as he finally drifted out of consciousness. My God! What do you guys think about that story? To my understanding, I believe Brad somehow survived this incident. He was mangled beyond recognition and had several painful surgeries, but I believe he made it out alive. But isn't that crazy how not only is it terrifying to be attacked by a single bear, but to imagine two bears gnawing away at your helpless body? I feel like it's quite rare of an incident for something like this to occur, but how terrifying is that? I believe that juveniles often stay with their mothers for several years when it comes to brown bears and grizzly bears. And these younglets can often reach several hundred pounds while still staying in the vicinity of their mother. And this is just one of those rare incidents where a human was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So it seems that you just have to really keep close watch if you're hunting in bear country and to make sure that you have a partner always watching your back. I've heard of examples like this before where one guy leaves and the other guy stays there cleaning the carcass and isn't paying attention and a bear attack occurs. But I don't know, what do you guys think about that incident? Let me know in the comments below. Really appreciate you guys coming by here to check out my videos. So stay tuned for more Chilling Tales from the Iceman.